Okay. Well, this is disappointing, so I apologize. Um, however, you can get the slides. Um, there's that QR code, same website. Um, and I'll write it on the board as well if you want to download that uh, to your screen. And I guess we don't need this anymore, do we? So am I am I broadcasting, I guess? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't see my all right. Okay, so so so. Okay, and if you can't access that, um, you can always access uh, this. Those are the slides for um, this whole class, um, and then uh, at the end of to, end of today. So tomorrow is going to be the last time I talk to you all, um, and so for tomorrow. Um, uh, uh, please choose what you would like to talk about. So this is the QR code for tomorrow. You can vote. Uh, vote tonight. Um, if you don't vote, uh, you don't get a choice. This is, uh, so this is how you can vote on what we talk about tomorrow. There are many topics that I have left that we can discuss. And so please come tomorrow. And I hope that the projector works. Um, but this, you can go to that website. It's just a Google form and vote on what you would like to discuss uh, tomorrow. Okay. So that's good to know. Uh, whoever vote, you can vote for a couple things too, if you'd like. Whoever um, votes, uh, whoever gets the most votes, that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. I think you can only vote once. Good. Don't vote more, more times than once. It's no fun. Okay. So when we last met, we discussed the Big Bang. And uh, let me uh, quiz you real quick. What, are, uh, what is primarily made in the Big Bang? Hydrogen and helium mostly. Yeah, mostly. A, a little bit of lithium, um, maybe a tiny bit of, of carbon, but mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, with, with a little bit of lithium. What, what's the problem that we have with the Big Bang? Does anyone remember? I mean, we have many problems, but what's one? Not enough lithium, right. Uh, um, our lithium, yeah, lithium-7. Our, our models um, predict way too much lithium. Um, and so something is strange, and it's either what we are observing or or there's some physics that we don't know about, which has been a very long problem. So if you can solve this problem, um, you, you'll be, uh, you, you will win a prize. Okay, so, so now we have um, the universe. It's made out of hydrogen and helium, um, mostly, uh, with a tiny, tiny bit of lithium. And at this point, we can start making stars. And so um, roughly on the order of a million years or so after the Big Bang, uh, things start coalescing. And so all the gas and dust in the universe can coalesce into stars. And so at this point, what we're going to do is we're gonna discuss, first of all, how stars make elements. Uh, it will be very, very brief. Um, probably you've heard a lot about this. And then we will uh, discuss how stars make, make the heavy elements. So right now we're just going to discuss ordinary stars, um, much like our sun. So, so take a look at this picture on the left-hand side here. Um, uh, a, a star like our sun starts off a, as a dust cloud. That dust cloud will compress. Uh, what, why would the dust cloud compress, by the way? Gravity. Yep, gra gravity makes the dust cloud compress. Eventually, the hydrogen nuclei in that dust cloud become close enough together that they can undergo fusion. Okay, remember we talked about fusion yesterday or the day before. Um, as the dust cloud compresses, it also heats up, it, it, effectively by friction. Uh, uh, um, you got all these atoms and, and dust uh, running into each other. And so it's producing that energy, then it's heating up. 
uh, until it gets to a point where the nuclei become close enough together that, that they can undergo fusion. So um, what, what keeps the dust cloud from, from compressing forever into a black hole? We have nuclear force. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. The, the heat from the fusion, right? Yeah. So there's two things going on. The dust cloud is compressing under its own gravity, and fusion is heating it up and making it expand. And those two things are always fighting each other. That's called hydrodynamics. Uh, you can model this on a computer. You can do fun experiments. And on the right-hand side of this slide here, there's a website there. Um, where you can go and, and there's some codes, you can either download them, but they also have a web interface where you can go to this website and just um, examine uh, different simulations for stars and you can make your own simulation. Yeah, it's really nice. T take a look at the top here. I say low mass stars and by low mass stars, I say stars with less than eight solar masses or more than 0 0.08 solar masses. Um, why do you think there's a limit to how low the mass of a star can be. That's a, a good answer, right? It's it's um really in order for fusion to start, the the protons have to get close together, right? Yeah. And so you have this mass to create a bigger gravity. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gravity and fusion. Exactly. Fusion. Exactly. There's a compromise between gravity and fusion. So, so Jupiter um, wouldn't become a star, even though it's very massive. There are some things that may be ten times the mass of Jupiter, which we call brown dwarfs, and and they're kind of borderline. Uh, they may be very hot in the center, maybe even hot enough to to emit light, but but won't undergo fusion. Yeah. And the light they emit would be black body radiation. So, so something gets hot. You know, if you heat up a piece of metal, it gives off light, right? It glows. Similar thing with brown dwarfs. They're not hot enough or dense enough to undergo fusion, but they um, are, are almost borderline. And so in this figure on the left-hand side here, you start off with a hydrogen core. Um, and this is just a cartoon, but that hydrogen will undergo fusion and make helium. Um, uh, that helium can undergo um, fusion and make carbon-12 and oxygen-16. If the star is massive enough, that carbon and oxygen can undergo fusion as well. Okay. For more massive stars, you can always fuse to higher masses. Okay. If the star is low mass, like our sun, our sun is one solar mass. If the star is low mass, it, it will probably fuse up the carbon before the end of its life, okay? Um, for higher mass, it can fuse to, to higher elements. So let's um, go on to the next slide here. Let's talk about how the sun, for example, um, produces energy. Uh, and you've probably heard about the PP chain. Does that sound familiar to you all? Proton, proton chain, yep. The PP chain is able to convert four protons into, into helium-4. So this is how our sun works. Um, if you look at the black lines on this figure, on the left-hand side here, you have two protons on the left side that make deuterium. Um, that deuterium captures, um, uh, excuse me, deuterium plus an, a positron. And, and that positron annihilates pretty quickly. Positrons and electrons annihilate. That gives off a lot of energy. So there's one source of energy there. The deuterium and another proton combine to make helium-3 but plus a gamma ray, a photon. Then that helium-3, two helium-3s combine to make helium-4 plus two protons. Okay. Now, now I said four protons combine to make helium-4, but at the end you see helium-4 plus two protons in that figure. Um, uh, but if you think about it, you need to make another helium-3 to make that helium-3 at the bottom. So, so it's, it's eight protons going in minus four protons going out. And so, so that's why I say net four protons um, for one helium-4 atom. Okay. Uh, now, take a look. Take a look at 
the reactions here. Um, wh which of those reactions do, do you think might be the slowest reaction? Uh, the, the, the last one. Um, uh, if it's a weak interaction, so, so they're called weak interactions because they're weak. So if it involves an electron or a positron, it's probably a lot slower. And, and so, so maybe that one that uh, um, converts the deuteron plus a, a, a positron and a neutrino. That's what we call a bottleneck. That's where the reactions slow down. Um, you see bottlenecks every day when you, when you drive on the streets in Catania. Yeah. Many cars go into one lane, <laughs> right? And all these other cars pile up, right? So, so, so that's what we mean. Now, sometimes the star has enough helium-3 and helium-4 in it that it can make beryllium-7. And, and so um, look at the blue. Uh, that's called the PP2 chain. Okay, so two heli uh, helium-3, helium-4 make beryllium-7. Um, um, and then the beryllium-7 undergoes electron capture, and it turns into lithium-7. And, and then that lithium, uh, excuse me, the lithium, the beryllium seven beta decays um, to lithium seven. Lithium seven um, will capture a proton to become helium four, and then helium four plus another helium four uh, um, can be made. Actually, the lithium seven captures a proton to make two helium fours. And so, in order for the PP two reaction to proceed, first of all, you need an, enough beryllium seven and um, enough lithium-7 to exist. So you need the PP1 reaction to run for a while. But you also need a higher temperature. And, and how do you think, uh, or why do you think you need a higher temperature for the PP2 to proceed? It, need, it needs more energy, right? Remember thermonuclear reaction rates? They are less, they are less stable than... So this transition is less stable than hydrogen, helium. It, it, it could be. It could be. You do have a half-life limitation there for beryllium. Um, uh, what else? What is keeping two charges from reacting? So, um, what prevents two charges? Strong uh, nuclear force. Uh, it is a force. It's not the strong force. It's the Coulomb force. Right? Like charges repel, right? So, so in the PP1 chain, I just have a proton and, and helium three at the most. So I have a charge of one and a charge of two, okay? In a PP2 chain, I have the proton and the beryllium seven. So I have a charge of one and, and a charge of four, okay? Bigger Coulomb four, so they need to go faster to collide with each other. And so that PP2 chain dominates at a higher temperature. Okay, and then you have the PP3 chain, um, which, which is very similar, and this this is even more massive nuclei. So generally, stars around the mass of the sun burn this way. Um, generally, if it's a little more massive, you can uh, have the PP2 chain and the PP3 chain because more massive stars can have a denser core, a hotter core. Um, they can over overcome those fusion barriers, uh, Coulomb barriers more. Okay. Now, if there's a homework question at the bottom here. Homework question is, is how much energy is generated in the PP1 chain? Okay. How, much, how, much, just, uh, how much energy is generated to take four protons and convert them to, to the one helium nucleus? Okay, so try to figure that out. Um, we talked about this on Wednesday, how you can figure out the energy generated in a reaction. Um, and then you can think about this. And then if you want, you can also do the PP2 and the PP3 chain, okay? Okay, now for stars that are even more massive on the next slide, um, the slide that says CNO cycle, for stars that are even more massive, uh, you have enough carbon 12 so that you can convert protons to another carbon 12 plus a helium four that carbon-12 is, is called a catalyst. It's a catalytic reaction. Um, you've probably heard that term in, in phys, uh, chemistry. 
a catalyst. If I have something and I put it in a, a, um, a solution, it doesn't change, but it helps make that reaction work. Okay, that generally is uh, requiring a, a more massive stars. Why do you think it has more massive stars? Or why do you think it requires more massive stars? In order to overcome Coulomb barriers involving carbon, right, you, you, you have to get nuclei closer together and they have to be hotter, okay? That was kind of a kind of a bad question because I didn't really tell you how the CNO cycle works, but I will show you that in a second here, okay? Um, and the temperature of the core uh, has to be about 14 million degree Kelvin or more, okay? So this is generally starts a little more massive than our sun. They can, they can um, produce enough carbon in the center um, to convert that hydrogen into, into helium, okay? Um, and take a look on the right-hand side. This is the, the energy generation. So look at the units on the vertical axis, MeV per grams per second. So if I have one gram of, of the sun's core, uh, one gram of the sun's core, by the way, is, is very tiny. I believe the core of the sun is 10 times the density of lead. But let's say I have one gram of the sun's core and, and I have it at some temperature. How much energy is produced by the PP chain um, per second? Okay. Same for the CNO cycle as well. Okay. If I have, have one gram of the sun's core, how much energy is produced per gram per second? And take a look. For low temperatures, the PP chain dominates. Okay. The CNO chain doesn't dominate because you can't overcome those Coulomb barriers to make enough carbon. Okay. At high temperatures, the CNO cycle dominates. That dominates because it can produce a lot more energy, okay, but also dominates because you can produce enough carbon to make it work. Right? And then you see where the sun sets in there. The core of the sun is about... Uh, um, 15 million Kelvin. By the way, that notation there, uh, T6, let me write it on the board. You see this a lot, and I'm probably going to show it to you a lot when we talk about really massive stars. T T6 just means um, 1 million Kelvin, and we see this a lot. Another term that we use quite a bit is T9 is equal to 1, 1 billion uh, Kelvin. It's just the notation that we use, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the next slide shows the, how the CNO cycle actually works, okay? Carbon-12 will capture a proton. Uh, by the way, what am I looking at on this picture here? We've seen this a thousand times already. What, what, what is this? Table of isotopes, yep. It's, it's, it's our roadmap for nuclear astrophysics. We, we always look at this all the time. Um, so, so you look at carbon-12 there, captures a proton to become nitrogen-13. Then nitrogen-13 beta decays. Uh, I don't have beta decay on there, but how do I know it's beta decaying? Beta decay always moves diagonally on this. See, beta decay preserves mass. It preserves baryon number, OK? Becomes carbon-13. Carbon-13 captures a proton. Nitrogen-14 captures a proton to become oxygen-15. And then oxygen-15 captures a, a nitrogen. And then how do you think nitrogen-15 goes all the way back to carbon-12? Any guesses? No, nope, you're right. It's not beta decay. You, you are correct. Um, it, it, it could could be thought of as a kind of fission. <laughs> so you have fission plus. There's a lot of protons around. Okay, it can capture a proton, but they're energetic enough. Take a look. It captures a proton to become carbon twelve plus plus alpha. So we call that we call that a P alpha reaction. By the way, we use a shorthand form for this. 
nitrogen 15 P alpha carbon 12. This is a, 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 a like same thing. This is a, a like an abbreviation for this. Okay. So that's called a P alpha reaction. And, and that actually uh, works pretty well in this. Oxygen 16 generally won't capture another proton. Uh, any guesses why? Oxygen 16 um, probably won't. It, there, it certainly will a little bit, but not that often captured. Because it's uh, nearer to neon than uh, it's stable. It's stable. So it's only two steps uh, away from uh, a normal gas. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yep. It's, it's two steps from a noble gas, even more that the Coulomb barrier, right? It's more massive. You need a higher temperature to overcome that Coulomb barrier. So this cycle will operate at a somewhat lower temperature. T take a look at the, at the bottleneck. Remember wh where it moves slowest. Nitrogen carbon, uh, excuse me, nitrogen 13 has a half-life of almost 10 minutes. And so that's the bottleneck. That's the slow part of the reaction. Okay, one of these reactions, one of these cycles, can, can take about ten minutes to go all the way through because of nitrogen thirteen. Okay, of course they're not all going at the same time, right? That would be strange. We would see the sun, you know, going nuts. It's it's a half life, and so so it's you have you know trillions of these reactions going on at the same time, all out of phase with each other. Now, if the temperature gets a little hotter, you can break out of this cycle. You can do what's called called CNO breakout, and you can go to the go to the next slide and take a look. CNO two. This this operates at a little hotter temperature. Remember, I said oxygen sixteen won't capture a proton in the CNO one cycle. It won't, but if the temperature is a little hotter, say slightly more massive star denser interior, more heat produced, you can, you can undergo what's called the CNO2 cycle. And the reactions are the same, okay? Um, the bottleneck here is, is oxygen 15, which beta decays, has a half-life of about two minutes, but you can see that you're cycling through. Now, wh why, do we, why do we call or no, let me back up. The reason nitrogen 14 and carbon 12 in these cycles are catalysts, because once you go one lap through the cycle, you're back to where you started. Effectively, the nitrogen 14 and carbon 12 don't change. Okay? Now, what do you think happens if the temperature is even a little bit hotter? Yeah, that's right. That's right. If the react, if it's a little bit hotter, the CNO cycle moves moves up the table of isotopes to more massive elements. Okay. So go to the next slide. We go to the CNO three cycle. You can see we've we've gone up now to a, a little more massive. We've gone up to oxygen eighteen. This this requires more massive stars, larger temperature inside, higher density in the center, and so. Uh, same reactions, proton capture, beta decays, and, and P alpha, P alpha reactions like this. Question? Uh, which, is, which is more massive and more hot between a white dwarf and a red supergiant? <laughs> this is kind of mesmerizing question for me. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, we'll talk about white dwarfs in a little bit, but red supergiants can get can get quite quite large. Um, Several times the mass of the sun. More massive. Um, quite, quite massive. Yeah, white dwarfs don't get much larger than 1.4 solar masses. And there's a reason for that. That's called the Chandra Sikar mass. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. That's a good question. Red supergiants can get huge, tens of solar mass. Uh, I don't know if stars that are several hundred solar masses go through the supergiant phase, but um, maybe. <laughs> Okay, now if the star is even a little more massive and the core is even a little hotter, you can go on to the next slide to the CNO4 cycle. Okay, look, looks a little different, but it's the same reactions. And so stars that have a mass of 
of say between one solar mass and eight solar masses can go through this, this cycle here. They can produce carbon, they can, can uh, burn hydrogen that way, um, they can end up producing oxygen, but when they get enough uh, helium in their core, then they undergo a different cycle. Okay, so right now all we're talking about is hydrogen burning. So where most of the core is hydrogen, but if you get enough of some of these other elements in there, that hydrogen will burn and become helium, okay? All right, so let's say we're talking about the sun. Let's say in about 4 billion years, um, the sun has used up all the hydrogen in the core, okay? It would still have an envelope. So the sun may look like uh, uh, like an onion. So in about four billion years, the sun will lose all the hy burn all the hydrogen in its core to to say helium. It will still have this this envelope of of hydrogen around it. Okay. What, what, why do you think this does not burn? Not, not hot enough, not dense enough, not dense enough, not hot enough, exactly right. Yep, that's exactly it, right? It's quite dense in the core here, gets very hot. However, we've used up all the hydrogen, okay? Uh, um, the core starts to, starts to shrink, okay? But it's not going to shrink forever. Why is that? It starts, starts burning helium, right? Yeah, it starts undergoing helium fusion. Okay, the hydrogen gets used up. Now it undergoes helium fusion. Okay, it, it'll shrink until until those nuclei get close enough together to start burning helium. Okay, now helium burns quite hot. Okay, and because of that, um, all that heat will take this hydrogen envelope and expand it out into space. Um, the sun will become about the size of Earth's orbit, okay? So in about 4 billion years, we're all going to die, all right, unless we figure something out, okay? I'm scared, right? Um, but the helium fusion is, in my mind, one of the most important series of reactions um, in nature. So go to the next slide here. Go to helium burning. This, is, this reaction is studied all over the place. This reaction is studied quite intently uh, at, at this university in this laboratory. Um, the people who study this reaction are, are world famous here um, because they do amazing work looking at this reaction. Okay, So take a look. The hydrogen is exhausted. The pressure drops, causing the core to, to collect, contract, and that will ignite helium. Okay, so this is what the sun looks like. Now it starts burning helium. Okay, take a look at these reactions on the left-hand side. They have an alpha plus an alpha making beryllium-8. By the way, what do we know about mass-8 nuclei? Uh, they're, they're unstable, right? There are no mass-5 or mass-8 stable nuclei in nature. In fact, beryllium-8 just um, is, wants to go back to two alpha particles, okay? Um, and, and it has a very short half-life. You can see that on the bottom. It's got a half-life of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So 0.1 femtoseconds. Then the beryllium-8 will capture an alpha particle to become carbon-12. Uh, the carbon-12 will capture an alpha particle to become oxygen-16. So the helium core undergoes this process and it begins to make carbon 12 and oxygen 16. Okay, so just like the hydrogen turned into helium, the helium is now turning into carbon and oxygen. Uh, this is called the triple alpha process. You'll see us often write it like that. Um, th th there's a lot of rich physics here. There's some amazing physics here. And we'll talk a little bit about that, all right? But let's first of all, take a look at that beryllium eight is really unstable. It does not last very long at all, all right? So you can think about the Q value between two, one alpha plus a beryllium eight, that second equation there, you can think about that Q value. Um, it's about uh, 7.2 MeV. Um, 
So it will generate energy, but the cross section or rather the reaction rate must be really, really low. Why do you think the reaction rate is so low? What would make the reaction rate so low in that reaction? Um, beryllium, right? If I have a beryllium atom, it needs to capture an alpha particle very, very quickly, right? Before it, it decays. And so most of the time, the beryllium is just going to decay back to two alpha particles. It needs to capture alpha particles enough so that it can produce the heat to keep the core alive. Okay. So, so what are some ways we can uh, increase the rate of, of the beryllium 8 plus alpha reaction? Heat is one. Yep. Uh, uh, sigma V, right? Like, what's the other one? Remember this? That comes from heat, right? And what is that one? No, no cr cross section, right? <laughs> Thermonucle thermonuclear reaction, right? right? I, I was told you just had a statistics lab. <laughs> statistics is great, but here it means cross section. <laughs> so, so there. Are, I told you how we can make the cross section. I talked about thermonuclear reaction rates. Uh, uh, last time, one thing I didn't talk about was um, resonances. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about resonances. Okay, a resonance is a quantum mechanics effect. Okay, in quantum mechanics, uh, we don't see particles, we see wave functions. So we can push the wave uh, until it's, it's uh, at a greater amplitude. I don't know. Uh, um, you're exactly right. The alpha particle looks like a wave. Normally, when we do nuclear reactions, uh, you can think of these two wave functions that are overlapping with each other. And if a wave function fits exactly into the nucleus, then that's a resonance. That's a simple way of calling a resonance. The wave function will fit exactly into the nucleus. No, awesome. Is that what it is? Oh, well, yeah. It's a wave equation. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, and the way the wave function fits exactly into the nucleus is it, it has to be the right energy. Okay. Let me show you what I mean. So let's go to the next slide. Um, here's a picture of the triple alpha reaction. You have two alpha particles becoming a beryllium-8. That beryllium-8 does not live long. So it captures another alpha particle. Okay. Um, because it doesn't live long, that reaction wouldn't occur at a fast rate. In order for it to occur at a fast rate, we need a very, very large cross-section. We, we need a resonance. Okay. That alpha particle has to be at exactly the right energy to increase this cross-section. Um, by the way, that, that's how radios work. When you tune your radio, you, you're, you're finding a resonance for the radio waves. You're finding a, a, where the frequency of the radio wave fits exactly into a circuit. Okay. Same thing here, because alpha particles are resonances. Do, do, do you still listen to radio today, by the way? Maybe not. Well, when I was a kid, I listened to radio. Yeah, all right. And so this guy in the lower left-hand corner, his name was Fred Hoyle. Um, arguably the founder of modern astrophysics. He was a British physicist. He postulated, he, he, he guessed, in order for there to be a resonance, there must be an energy state in carbon-12 where that alpha particle fits exactly so that the wavelength is the same. And he was right. He predicted this energy state in carbon-12. He didn't even know about it. He predicted it. And years later, we're still studying it. It's one of the most famous excited states in a nucleus. It's called the Hoyle state. I'll show you a little more about it in a bit. Yes. Excuse me, but uh, since the beryllium alpha particles is so low, uh, does the and, and does the um, considerable speed, right? Uh, the velocity here, yeah, yeah. And, and and this is big too. Yes. 
So does um, time dilation um, does time dilation increase the the, the chance of a uh, meridian undergoing the, the process? Oh, does time dilation increase the chance that that reaction occurs? I've never thought about that. that that's an interesting question. Um, the only situations I've ever thought about were um, for for uh, uh, in normal stars. Um, that, that, that burn that. So I suppose if you had something on the surface of a black hole or something, you could add that. Um, I guess I guess on the surface of a neutron star, you might have that. So some neutron stars will accrete matter, and they'll they'll undergo a rapid proton capture process. And I think they do this hot CNO breakout, and so they do undergo something similar. So, but but you would have to include time dilation for sure. By the way, Fred Hoyle wasn't just a great physicist. He was also a uh, science fiction author. So there's a copy of one of his, one of his books there. If you like science fiction, um, uh, he, he wrote some, some interesting books. So let's talk about resonance. Let's talk a little bit about resonance here. Um, go to the next slide. So this is an energy, energy diagram. OK. We, you can think of the energy diagram as how we graphically represent Q values. OK, um, you've got the, the think of it as the the binding energy of carbon 12 and then think of it as the energy of the other nuclei involved there. So we have carbon 12 here. It's got some sort of mass to it. It's got some sort of binding energy. And then we have beryllium 8 plus an alpha particle. OK, we, we add up those masses together. OK. And, and, and that would be somewhere up here. So, so think of this as, as mass energy, OK? So beryllium A plus an alpha particle. And, and, and the energy difference between those two is about uh, 7, uh, I believe I said 7.3, um, 7.3 MeV, so around 7.3 MeV. That's the Q value of this reaction. OK, so so if I can capture an alpha particle at some rate, okay, I can make a carbon 12. How can I increase the rate? Well, quantum mechanically, if there is an energy state, if there's an excited state of carbon 12 somewhere up here, then this reaction will go into this excited state a lot faster. The cross section is huge because I can fit the wave function in there just nice, okay? So Fred Hoyle said, well, there must be some sort of excited state there. And, and he was right. Um, it wasn't exactly at this energy. It was a little higher than, than this energy, but it still works. Why does it work? Now, now take a look. Now it looks like to get here, we need a negative Q value, right? Ne negative Q value is absorb energy, but this reaction will still work. Why do you think? Is, is this assumes that that the, the alpha particles in the beryllium mate are at, at at zero MeV. Right? This assumes the alpha particle plus the beryllium mate are, 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 are have zero velocity, right? Yeah. They they have to have some velocity because they're in the center of a hot star, right? And so they have a thermal distribution. Okay. So you could imagine if I were to plot the velocity of, of the alpha particle, so let's make an axis here, call it velocity, it would look something like that, and everything up here gets captured. Okay. Isn't that interesting? That's, by the way, called a sub th above threshold resonance. Um, one of the most famous reactions in nuclear astrophysics. What would happen if this if this state did not exist? There wouldn't be enough carbon-12 to have humans. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it, right? There wouldn't be enough carbon-12 to make, make humans, and, and there'd be no point studying it because, well, we're not here, right? So, yeah. I, I, all of life effectively depends on this right here. Yeah. yeah. If this state didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to make carbon-12 life as we know it would be dramatically different. Um, on a bad day, that could be a good thing, I guess. I don't, I don't, so, all right? Then there's the question, 
why do we this this thing in that specific spot? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why why this state exists here? Um, how it decays. This is a this is another very very big field of astrophysics today. Studying this state, um, scientists like to study exactly the characteristics of this state. Okay. Uh, by the way, the other thing um, to mention is um, because of quantum mechanics, this state also has like 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 a width to it. It's kind of fuzzy. Okay. So so that state also has some kind of width there. It's it's a statistical width for that state, okay? So you studied statistics. There's a probability that that state will overlap with these two here. So quite, quite interesting, quite interesting. Now we've made carbon-12. Carbon-12 can capture a proton and make oxygen-16, okay? So that would be on the, um, well, next slide is kind of a summary there. And carbon-12 can uh, capture uh, alpha particle. I think I said proton alpha particle, make oxygen-16. Take a look at that slide, burning in massive stars. I'll just cover it very briefly. I talked about the Hoyle state. Remember that, because if you like astrophysics, you will see that all the time. Um, see that? It says stars between four and eight solar masses. They'll burn hydrogen through carbon. And of course, they'll burn off their outer envelope too for the same reason that the sun will burn off its outer envelope. The core will contract, it'll blow stuff into space, it'll get hot, it'll blow that hydrogen envelope into space. Oh, uh, by the way, we see them. They're called planetary nebula. You can just look this up. That's the result of stars blowing their hydrogen envelope out into space. Uh, if I'm not so wrong, uh, uh, in, uh... And during this period of time, we are uh, looking for one of these uh, stars. I think it's uh, Leonis something. And it's a great star with uh, this envelope. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And some uh, light rays uh, come to that. And there is this beautiful image of. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, know, I, I think you're right. Uh, yeah. Astronomers like to look at these because this also tells us the spectra of type 1a yeah. supernova, which tells us a little bit about how they're formed and tells us about the evolution of chemicals in our galaxy. So absolutely, these, these are important to study. Um, once that star has progressed enough in its evolution, it will um, have a carbon and oxygen core. And so it might look something like, uh, you've got this hydrogen envelope, you've got this, this helium envelope, you might have a carbon and an oxygen core. Uh, quite often, you'll have some neon in there. Maybe some magnesium, maybe, depending on how massive the star is. Okay. But eventually, this outer envelope will just get blown off. And what you'll have is you'll have a small star in the center with this, all this gas surrounding it. That's the planetary nebula. And this will be what we call a white dwarf. It's yeah. very, very small. Um, uh, generally, um, less than 1.4 solar masses. We'll talk about why 1.4 solar masses is important in a little bit. Uh, in the case of the sun, uh, it will just cool down until it becomes dark and just becomes a dark lump of coal in space. So that's our depressing future here. Right? Uh, depending on the white dwarf, it may accrete matter from another star. It could collide with another star and form what's called a type 1a supernova, okay. where all of this shoots matter into space. Uh, the most violent explosions in the universe because the whole star just blows up um, and there's nothing left except all these ashes. So, okay. Question so far? Okay. Take a look at the right-hand side of that figure. Um, certainly there are stars with more than eight solar masses, okay? And so far, it looks like we've described ways that stars can burn. And by the way, if you're interested in reading more, all I did was give you a very, very, very brief introduction. You, you can check out uh, one of those books that I recommended, I believe, chapter two. But double check that. 
Okay. So we know how stars can make carbon and oxygen. By the way, type 1a supernova are very important. Why is that? Because in order to form our solar system and Earth, that carbon and oxygen has to get out into space, right? If it's trapped in the star forever, we still wouldn't exist, right? Yeah. So somehow this has to get into space. So type 1a supernova are very nice. We like them. Um, we, we wouldn't want one to occur nearby anytime soon, but we, we are thankful that they occurred um, billions of years ago. Okay. Now, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Could this uh, sort of lump of coal be uh, at this, um, maybe uh, at the center of a, a uh, can, can become a planet uh, in the future? Can it become a planet? Uh, it's quite, quite dense. I, I, I suspect. Quite often, they will become a, um, uh, a black hole. They collide, yes. Two of them collide, yep, yep. And enormous quantities of gravitational waves. Yeah, yeah. It's not, okay, it's not like um, a meteorite. It's not a real lump of coal. It's yeah, it's not a rock. I mean, the, the sun will continue to um, be a white dwarf for trillions of years, uh, several ten times the age of the, of the universe. And, and, and so, um, if, if the universe is around that long, which it probably won't because it will have redshifted itself into oblivion, uh, um, we'll be able to see the final fate of those. Yep. Okay, so um, stars can make up the carbon and oxygen. We described that. We've talked about some definitions there. I gave you a very, very brief introduction to that. Um, there's a lot of fields of study that talk about this. That website I gave you, you can go and you can simulate your own star, which is really kind of neat. You can see how, how, how it makes this uh, core. You can change the mass. There's a web interface there. Um, the software, by the way, is called uh, Mesa. I, I use this all the time in my work. In fact, I just published a paper last week where we used this to calculate something. So, so, so... Uh, re real astrophysicists use this a lot. It's quite, quite, quite enjoyable. It's a nice tool. Um, recommend you try it uh, for fun. Okay, if the star is massive enough, so stars that have a mass greater than eight solar masses, um, they can continue to fuse carbon and oxygen. They can fuse carbon and carbon to make magnesium. They can fuse oxygen and oxygen. Um, they, they can make... Uh, um, uh, sulfur along the way. Usually what they'll do is they'll make these alpha chain elements. They can make uh, neon oxygen. They can make all the way up to silicon and then iron. Okay, so you can have a star, again, with these cores. Every time it, it uh, uh, continues to burn and it burns up its fuel, it'll continue to contract till it ignites the next fuel, continue to contract till it ignites the next fuel. At some point, you're going to be left with, if the star is massive enough, uh, is there a picture on the next page? No, there's not a picture. At some point, if the star is massive enough, you're going to be left with um, – this is not the scale, but you're going to be left with the star with many, many, many different layers. We have a hydrogen envelope. And an iron core, and, and the star will not go past that. How come the star will not fuse iron? Uh, it's not too massive. Say that again. The reaction becomes endothermic. That's exactly right. Yeah. It needs energy, right? So it can't. Fuse the on iron. Remember that curve we drew a uh, couple days ago where we showed the binding energy per nucleon? Helium was a spike, and then you had something that looked like this as a function of mass. Iron was way up there. So, so nuclei in the iron nickel region, okay? it's somewhere around iron or nickel, uh, that will be what the core is. Okay. At that point, things become really exciting. So if stars can only make iron, what, what's the problem here? Uh, 
how the other elements are made. Yep. That's one of the biggest questions in science today, how the other elements are made. We know they exist because we see them. Uh, we use them. Uh, your cell phone has a lot of rare earths in it. Okay. Some of you are wearing jewelry that's made out of gold. How were those elements made? Turns out they were all made in space. Okay. So, so everything you have, um, you know, your cell phone here was the elements were made in space. If you have gold jewelry, it was made in space. Uh, what I want to show you is just one more slide where we talk about how quickly these burning phases last. So go to the next slide. Um, there's a table there, uh, shows you the burning phase, the hydrogen burning phase, helium, carbon, neon, oxygen, silicon. It shows you the temperature of that burning phase. So you can see in order to fuse oxygen, it has to be very, very, very hot. In order to fuse silicon, it has to be very hot. And the reason is because you have these Coulomb barriers that you have to overcome, okay? Also has to be very dense. So you can see the density. And then my, my favorite column there, the, the duration, how long it's burning for. So when a star forms a silicon core, it's only burning silicon for one day before it makes an iron core. And then things get really exciting, okay? Questions? That's a good question. Let's talk about it. We'll talk about it, all right? So um, we're going to go on to the, uh, we have some time. So we'll go on to the lecture number three. Lecture number three, if you are uh, downloading these from the web page or you're just looking at them, I will show you lecture number three. Okay. Um, so we know how the universe can make all the elements up to iron, right? One of you already said, well, there's a problem. We know there's heavier elements. Okay. How does the universe make those heavy elements? We know iron can be made in stars. Anything lighter than iron can be made in stars. How are the heavier elements made? And, and I'll spend up. Um, pulsars. Uh, pulsars have something to do with it. Yes. Pulsars have something to do with it. Could it be, could it be thanks to the energy released today on its uh, supernova? Supernova are, are a, a really good idea because remember, however we make the element, it has to get into space, right? It, it, if I have a star and it makes iron and then it just stops and it doesn't get into space, it doesn't help me at all, right? Because, because we know that elements are ejected into space because we see them on the earth, right? We thought the earth coalesced from some sort of dust in space, right? So it has to get into space. So we'll talk about how that works. So things like supernova, that makes a lot of sense. And things like pulsars, because they're shooting stuff into space, makes sense to me. So let's talk about this. Um, I'm gonna go over some basic definitions. We'll talk about the heavy elements here. We'll talk about what we call neutron capture processes. Um, talk about uh, specifically what we call the R process. And if we have time, I don't think we'll have time, we'll talk about galactic chemical evolution. Uh, by the way, this is kind of at the uh, graduate student level. So if you understand this, you're doing very, very well. Okay? So let's go on. <clears throat> so what am I looking at here? Table of isotopes again. We're going to get bored from looking at the table of isotopes. Take a look at that comment on the lower right-hand side there. Um, so far in nature, we have observed about 3,000 nuclei. Okay. Um, we suspect that there are as many as, as 7,000 nuclei that exist. Okay, so we haven't even observed half the nuclei. Okay, and, and that number, by the way, uh, has a large uncertainty. Okay. It could, could, could be uncertain by as much as a few hundred. Okay. Now there's some colored lines on that chart and we're gonna talk about those in a little bit. But what I want you to note are the blue line that says S process and the purple line that says R process. Uh, those lines 
uh, cover the nuclei relevant to those processes. So the S process um, includes nuclei that are very close to stable nuclei. The R process includes nuclei that are very, very, very unstable. I haven't defined them, so let's talk about them. But first, let's go back to the astronomy. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, let's go to some definitions here. Just some notation. Um, we use what's called the bracket notation. Um, that is the abundance of elements in some environment, number of nuclei. So if I have a nucleus A and a nucleus B, those are just labels. The bracket notation is, is the ratio of A over B in some star minus the same ratio in the sun. So it's normalized to the sun, okay? It's like a ratio. There's another notation there. Um, the astronomers use it a lot. It's called log eps. That's the ratio of some nucleus to the amount of hydrogen in a star plus 12. And the reason we add 12 is because it makes it a convenient number for us to use. Uh, um, it's a logarithmic. What's that? Because it makes it convenient to use. The 12 makes, so your numbers aren't like really negative or really positive. They're kind of around zero. Yep. And you can relate the bracket notation to the log eps notation. <clears throat> now there's one more definition that we want to get into and that's electron fraction. Um, total number of protons over all of the baryons, okay? So I add up all protons and neutrons, the fraction of protons over all the protons and neutrons. Why do you think I call it electron fraction and not proton fraction? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have the same number of electrons as protons in a plasma. If you don't, it's really weird. Things, weird things happen. It, 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 it can happen. Um, and that you, you get into some really interesting plasma physics. Normally you want them to be the same because if they're not the same, you have a potential difference and it's gonna equilibrate anyway, it's gonna be the same. So historically we just say electron fraction. Yes. Okay. Historically we, we just call it electron fraction, but it's the proton fraction as well. And the assumption is that the number of electrons is the same as protons which is generally very true, um, except in some exotic cases. Okay. Um, let me just remind you about some reactions there. Uh, neutron capture, you capture a neutron, right-hand side there. Uh, beta minus decay means you turn a, a neutron into a proton in a nucleus, okay? Um, there's also neutrino interactions at the bottom there. Those are important. Uh, neutron capture, uh, neutron plus a neutrino, proton plus an anti-neutrino. Those reactions will turn neutrons into protons, okay? And by the way, those reactions will occur in atomic nuclei as well. So I could have a, a, a neutrino capture on an um, iron 56 nucleus. It'll turn that neutron to a proton um, within the nucleus. And so now I have, uh, let's see, one above iron, I believe is cobalt 56. So you can do that as well, okay? Then there's another reaction there, any other kind of neutrino. So uh, a, a tau neutrino, anti-tau, a mu neutrino, an anti-mu neutrino, plus a neutron or proton, just, just it, it doesn't change the neutron to a proton, it just um, scatters off of them, okay? So it can impart energy. Okay? Remember those reactions because they become very important later on, right? Uh, the neutrino interactions. Especially remember that the Elect and the anti-neutrino interactions um, are different than that third reaction there, okay? Okay, so that's some definitions. Let me go to the next slide here. Do you remember this? <clears throat> Nuclear abundances, yeah. We looked at that. We looked at that on the very, very first day. In fact, I think we looked at that in our first half hour together. Okay, one of you, one of you asked a very good question. One of you asked, 
why do those abundance peaks occur in pairs? And why is one of them smoother than the other? So, so let me just try to reproduce this chart up here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to reproduce for say mass, uh, um, mass 100 and above, okay? So, so mass 100, I'm just gonna write down the last half of the chart. And the reason is because those are the nuclei we're interested in, right? We're, we're interested in the heavy nuclei. Right? We're, we're interested in iron and stuff too, but, but let's think about these heavy nuclei, mass 100 and above, it, it kind of looks like uh, um, like this, and then you've got, and of course th this will test my artistic skills as it will your imagination. Okay, and so so we've got somewhere around uh, around mass two hundred and somewhere around mass one thirty. Um, of co of course it's it's jagged, right? But but you kind of can see the idea. These two abundance peaks. So you cannot, can you see what I'm trying to do up here? Okay. So <clears throat> the question is, is, is how was this made? And remember when we talked about nuclear structure? Okay. Yeah. The nuclei aren't just aren't just balls. Um, they could have some 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 different closed shells. They can have uh, be more stable than others. This has a lot to do with nuclear structure. Now, quite a while ago, um, when people looked at this, they said, these peaks, first of all, they occur in pairs. I've got a peak here and a peak here, peak here, peak here. Um, and they noticed that, that one peak was kind of, kind of broad and another peak was, was a little more sharp, okay? And so, just hypothetically, this was purely hypothetical, they thought, well, well, maybe there are two processes for making these. You, you know, you have one process here, which we eventually discovered is called R, that, that's these two, and another process here, which we discovered, which was called S. So, so this was all hypothetical. This was not necessarily true, but it was a guess, okay? So that's one interesting thing. Um, something more interesting, go to the next slide. <clears throat> this is very interesting. This is in my mind, probably the most interesting slide I'm going to show today. Um, is this a related dimension numbers? <laughs> it, it, it is, but not quite. Okay, what you're looking at is um, the abundance pattern in a metal poor halo star. Okay, so what's special about metal poor halo stars? Those are called population three stars. Okay, the sun is called a population one star. Does anyone know what that means? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, that graph is population two, not three. Um, but what happened in the formation of our galaxy, we had the very first stars. Okay, those were called population three. We call it top three. These were the very first ones. Okay, what were they made out of? Hydrogen, hydrogen and helium, right? Hydrogen and helium. Yep. Okay. Those stars lived out their lives. Some of them went supernova, and the ashes of those stars, when they grew all their material into space, formed the next generation of stars, what we call population two stars. Okay. So you, you can kind of think of this as the second generation. Now, now this now they all didn't explode at the same time, of course. It, you know, it, it was a nice um, even distribution, but we can, so these are really just labels, okay? So population three stars were made out of hydrogen and helium. They blew all their matter into space. These population two stars lived their lives and they became population one stars. That includes the sun, okay? So when these stars blew up, they blew their matter into space. All the stuff they blew into space became the population two stars. What do you think these are made out of? 
or in your element. The carbon, carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, iron, iron. But 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 they're also made out of uranium, uh, tantalum, gold, silver, all the heavy elements. Okay. Well, we know if uh, studies uh, of uh, the third of the population of the first population or the second because of the elements that are inside. The yes, yes, and we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. Okay, this was mostly. Um, it's it's still rare. I mean, these were still mostly made out of hydrogen, helium, and and some carbon and oxygen. But it turns out this was found in their atmospheres. Scientists look at the light coming from these stellar atmospheres, and they see absorption lines from heavy elements, stuff that's heavier than that. Yeah, the spectra. Yep. And what? They are not in the lower. Um, no, no, they're 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 throughout the star. We see them in the atmospheres. Yep. And how do you say for, from from the ashes of the population three stars. Yep. How many? Uh, okay, now now we're at the sun. That's the present. We know this stuff exists. We know all the elements exist. Um, but what I want to show you, and this really amazes me, this is, now this is not true for every population two star, but it's true for a large number of them. Look at this figure on the left-hand side, okay? The, the dots, the dots, um, this is a star, it's called CS22892052. It is a population two star. By the way, the, the way we age stars is by how much iron is in the star. Because we know these guys can make iron too, right? And iron is constantly poured into the universe. So as, as the galaxy ages, the amount of iron goes up. Okay. So we can look at the iron anyway. This has, yeah, these have no iron, okay? And so the amount of iron is zero. These have a little iron, and these have more iron, okay? But we look at the atmospheres of the population two stars and take a look. Um, we can see these elements in the stars. Those dots are the relative abundance of all those elements, barium, neodymium, dysprosium, osmium, um, in the star CS2289205. It's just a tiny star on the edge of our galaxy. Now the line, what is that line? Um, not necessarily expected one, although that's a good guess. That's that's the that's the abundance of those elements in our sun. Okay, they're very similar, and that amazed astronomers very early on. Um, it, it's an absolutely amazing uh, um, prospect. How in the world this got to be? How is it that the population two stars have the same abundance pattern? Not necessarily the same abundances, but the same pattern as the population one stars. You would think that if the sun has uranium in it or osmium or something, um, the abundance of osmium or all these heavy elements should depend on the abundance in the population two stars, right? Because these came before this one. Yeah. But it doesn't. The relative abundances, relative abundances, are the same. Okay? That tells me that whatever made these heavy elements, elements heavier than iron, it's called primary. It doesn't depend on what came before it. Okay? Now, there are a couple primary processes in nature. Many primary processes in nature are completely destructive. If I wanted to assemble uranium and tantalum and dysprosium in a star, and I don't want it to depend on what that star is made of, what's one way of doing it? Taking that star and tearing it all the way down to its individual protons and neutrons, and then putting them back together again, right? So if I gave you a... Um, 
a Fiat and a Cadillac. And I said, I want you to make me two cars and I want them both to look the same. You would, you would, you would completely, you would melt down both cars, right? Yeah. So that they were liquid metal and then pour them into your own mold and make them the same. And, and that's the same principle here, okay? Regardless of what you think about Fiat's or Cadillac's. Right? So this was an amazing find in nature. Now it's not true for all these stars, but, but the fact that this exists is very, very interesting, okay? The fact that we can find stars like this. Now there are exceptions and we'll talk about those exceptions, but as a basic principle, this is pretty amazing, okay? That, that the heavy, there are stars out there with heavy element abundance patterns that match the sun, okay? So let's go to the next slide. This was, uh, this puzzle, where these heavy elements came from, was postulated um, almost 60, 70 years ago by these people here, Margaret Burbage, Jeffrey Burbage, Willie Fowler, and Fred Hoyle. Um, four good friends, four astrophysicists. They published this paper on the right-hand side, which uh, according to many is the fundamental paper for all of modern astrophysics. Um, this is required reading for all of my first year graduate students. I give this to them on the very first day and say, read this, don't come back until you understand it. Um, this, uh, this is why I have my job. Um, um, this really set the research that leads to what we're doing today, including things like, like this Hoyle state, this triple alpha reactions, carbon-12 reaction, and the processes that made these, these heavy stars, okay? Now, the rest of these slides cover that process there, okay? Um, we talk about it, but we are out of time today, so I'll plan on seeing you all tomorrow. And don't forget to vote on what you want to talk about tomorrow, okay? Yeah, yeah. Have a good evening, everyone. possible to find this article online. Yep, yep. It's it's published online in the Review of Modern Physics. Uh, this university probably has a library, an online library. Um, by the way, that's where I got that, that page of the article is I just downloaded it. If you can't find it, just send me an email. I'll send you a copy. Yep. What's that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it might even be open access. So, yeah.